And uh, before we kick off, I have to uh, do a little bit of technical business and conduct an emergency general meeting uh, to confirm the election of two new vice chairs. Uh, delighted to welcome Owen Thompson, MP, and Ian Stone, MP, who are joining the panel. Uh, I just have to confirm that we have uh, support for them joining today, which I'm sure we do. I don't see anybody indicating that we don't. So on that basis, I will proceed and welcome our attendees. And um, delighted to see that everybody is also uh, joining as well. Uh, one or two people just coming in. Uh, I can see we'll uh, we'll just do a little bit of an introduction and talk through some of the housekeeping rules. Um, first of all, if I can ask you to mute your microphones and direct any questions that you have through the written chat function, which we'll try and uh, include within the Q&A uh, towards the end of this session. The event is being recorded for promotional purposes and you may see yourself appearing on YouTube or on the APPG website uh, in the future. Uh, so please remember, if you are on video, keep smiling. Uh, we don't want to see your grumpy faces appearing on a YouTube channel somewhere in the future. Um, this obviously is an all-party parliamentary group and the uh, idea behind APPGs is that they're here to uh, inform and uh, update members of the House of Commons and the House of Lords so that when we, they are conducting their business in Parliament, they are informed on the issues that matter uh, within each sector. And as we're talking today about news, it's a very relevant section and uh, we're looking at uh, some of the issues today around uh, the way that news will be funded in the future. Um, I am delighted to say that we have uh, four really outstanding speakers with us today uh, and I'm going to give them just a minute to introduce themselves now. I'm going to start with the CEO of Public Interest News Foundation, Jonathan Haywood. Uh, thank you very much Andy, good morning everyone, very good to be here. Um, I'm glad that the APG is ho hosting uh, this important discussion. So uh, yeah, as, as you say Andy, I'm, I'm the Executive Director of the Public Interest News Foundation or PIN which was launched earlier this year to try to build capacity into the public interest news sector across the UK. And in particular, what we're focusing on at the outset is those smaller independent news publishers. We calculate there may be up to 500 who are publishing either on a local basis or they're specialising in investigative journalism or they're serving the needs of otherwise underrepresented communities. And what we're trying to do is to raise funding so that we can award that funding but also run professional development programs to support those I think in many cases fantastic but desperately under resourced um, publishers to, to survive and thrive. Excellent thank you very much indeed. Uh, second on our panel today is uh, the director of News Now uh, who are sponsoring this event today which we are incredibly grateful for uh, Adam Newby. Thanks very much. Um, Yes, as uh, Andy said, I'm, I'm a director of News Now. I've been with uh, News Now for uh, more than 20 years, almost since its uh, inception. News Now is a, it's a UK-based news aggregation website. So we publish headlines that link to, to breaking news from a diverse range of credible, independent, and public interest news sources. And um, our mission is we want to, to help the news serve people better because a healthy society needs a healthy news diet. So we're trying to bring that diverse diet to our users. I wasn't aware you'd been around for that length of time and, and are you operating yeah. all across the UK? Uh, well yes I mean we're we're a, we're a, a news website so you know in principle our audience is global but we're primarily UK focused and uh, yeah we've been around since uh, since 1998 so we're <laughs> we're a dot-com survivor. Thank you very much. Great to have you with us today. Uh, third on our panel is the Director of Public Policy at The Guardian Media Group, Matt Rogerson. Thanks, Andy. Um, uh, Matt Rogerson, yeah, I, I, I've been with The Guardian now for, uh, I think, it's seven years. So not, not the 20 that uh, Adam's managed. But um, so my, my focus at The Guardian is looking at kind of issues that affect um, uh, The Guardian from a, from a commercial perspective in terms of um, ensuring that we can get our content out uh, distributed that we can monetize that content and that our journalists are free to as much as possible do their job without um, uh, intervention from from external sources so um, uh, yeah it's a very interesting role obviously today is very interesting because the CMA announcement which I'm sure we'll talk about but that's clearly a big um, a big concern a big uh, big 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 uh, development for the industry so 
And of course, the, the Guardian in a bit of a unique position in that it's funded through a trust set up to ensure um, journalism in perpetuity. Uh, yes. You know, that, that, that gives you a very unique position in the media market. It does indeed. Uh, it does indeed, Andy. And, and um, I'm sure uh, viewers know that you, you used to work at Guardian Media Group. Um, and part of that endowment is, is comprised of um, the sales of previous businesses that the media group has owned. So... Um, GMG Radio was was one of those businesses. Um, Auto Trader was one of those businesses. This is this is money that we've earned from from other businesses that within the group that now fund uh, the businesses going forward to, to kind of prepare us for the challenges to come. Excellent. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, welcome today the director of uh, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, Rachel Olroyd. Hi, thanks Andy. Um, yes, I run uh, an organisation called the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. We are a not-for-profit organisation. We've been around for 10 years and our mission is to um, deliver um, investigative journalism in the public interest. So we are, are totally focused on um, stories that um, benefit and are really important to the public. And um, We're based on a, a model that is quite thriving in the US, which is um, say not-for-profit model. Um, I also have another hat um, here today, which is that I'm a trustee of a, a organization called um, Pub Public Benefit Journalism Research Center, and that center is focused on defining what public benefit journalism is and um, how it can get access to um, charitable status. So that is an area that I will be talking about later, no doubt. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. So there are four panellists today. And of course, uh, the APPG uh, relies on you asking questions as well. If you're a member of the uh, House of Parliament, we'd very much welcome your input. Uh, but if you're here viewing for the first time watching an APPG, uh, you're welcome to take part as well. All you need to do is put your question into the chat function and we'll try and come to those as we move through the uh, sessions. Um, we're gonna talk through uh, with the panelists on some of the issues related to the theme of today's uh, APPG, funding and regulating public interest journalism in a world of fake news. Uh, and as I said, we will come to some questions uh, from you as we move through that. Uh, you need to just pop them into the chat function though, and that's the best way that we can uh, we can get them to you. Um, let's kick off with our first set of questions. Um, and I'm gonna come to you first, uh, Adam, on this. Public interest journalism is, is widely considered to be the fourth estate upholding our democracy, but how would you describe its state of health and uh, what do you think it's so important to continue to support this? Thanks, Andy. Well, um, it'd be interesting to see what the other panel members think, but um, I think that public interest journalism is in crisis. Um, and I think there are a number of factors that have come together to produce this crisis. There's a, a general issue with, with the funding of the news media. I think um, since the inception of the internet, um, the news media has been trying to struggling to to find an appropriate funding model it used to be that newspapers were funded through print ads that's obviously uh spending on print ads has, has taken a nosedive um the online ad market has has exploded and there's lots more places for people to book their ads and obviously social media coming on the on the scene and the dominance of of certain key players in in taking a lot of the ad spend facebook google et al um, that's been an issue. Um, local news is a particular problem. Um, again, local newspapers used to be the go-to location to book classified ads. I can recall doing that back in the day. Um, but that's been disintermediated now. Um, people don't book their classified ads there and that source of revenue has gone away and local news has been struggling to find a suitable uh, source of funding. Local news is, is particularly important there's multiple studies that show that um where local newspapers close you get uh, a decline in in voter turnout in local elections you get more more corruption um there's even a study that shows that um if you don't have a local newspaper caught um keeping uh, calling local politicians to account then government spending is less efficient you actually end up spending less efficiently because you're not getting scrutinized so um yeah local news is extremely important um i think 
public interest journalism is we're talking about a specific type of journalism obviously there's a lot of journalistic output but not all of it is strictly public interest and um people don't wait when we talk about public interest journalism we're talking about current affairs news and this kind of thing and people don't read this this type of news out of self-interest generally reading it they're reading it to be informed about uh about the wider world um that about what local government is up to this, this kind of thing and so this this argues for um different funding models for this particular type of journalism than than for others um and i think government has a role to to play in in providing funding and and other types of incentives to encourage public interest journalism um the flip side of this crisis is social media um obviously this is uh very much uh, uh in the air at the moment all of these issues with with social media social media operate an attention economy um they are basically selling users attention they're ad funded and um this is driving i mean it's it's driving as we know uh extreme viewpoints um uh, because whatever gets the most attention is is what makes the most money for them and um from the point of view of of journalism i think um news outlets have had to also adapt to this type of funding model so they're also um having to go for people's attention and there's a danger that that this also drives journalism and clickbait because if if all you want to do is get people's attention you want to get the click through to your article so you get some money from ads then um then you want to produce journalism that is as cheap as possible and and as uh, and as attention grabbing as possible so the environment that social media creates is not conducive to uh, to public interest journalism and obviously all of these effects combined um we've increasingly seen the disastrous effects of this i mean we're seeing it now with this coronavirus pandemic that governments in the uk and and elsewhere are trying to get out public health messages but they're having to compete with misinformation and fake news which is spreading on on social media um one element of this is the rise of the anti-vaxxer movement um that's uh driven by social media and and fake news and other misinformation that that's out there so there could be a serious consequence for public health when uh the government tries to roll out a coronavirus vaccine because there could be resistance to people actually taking it. Um, so we really need public interest news and we need to find ways for it to be funded uh, by the people that, that it serves. But without doing something to tackle social media, and I think regulation is the answer, then that investment will potentially be wasted because we need to make sure that, that public interest news gets the audience that it deserves. Okay, thank you very much. So really um, great way to, to start. You, you've raised some really relevant points. I, I want to come back in, in a moment to how we should be funding it. But, but Rachel, if I can go to you, give us your, your view on the, the state of health of, um, of, of public interest journalism and why it's so important. Um, so a few points I'd like to add. Um, I mean, I'd largely agree with Adam that um, public, the state of public um, interest journalism is quite precarious. Um, I think we should not be too hand-wringing. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of innovation um, over the past few years. We're seeing um, papers like the New York Times really starting to thrive. Um, models are starting to, to come about that are bringing funds into the sector. Um, but if you scratch beneath the surface, if you scratch beneath the, the, the big beasts of the industry, um, things are quite bleak. And Adam talked about local news. I think that is an area we really need to, um, to, to be very aware of, the, that, that this is a really precarious situation, um, that we have places in this country that are no longer served by a news outlet. And, and this is really, really concerning and really worrying because um, you know, people need to know what, are what is going on in their area. They need to know how big issues such as the pandemic affect them at a personal, issue, at a personal level. And we need to make sure that power authority um, corporations are, um, locally are held to account. So, you know, I think the, the local sector 
is deeply worrying. And we do have not just areas of the UK where we have no local news anymore, but we have big parts of our, of our institutions and of our, um, that are in the dark. So there are courts all over this, this land that no longer have reporters. You know, when I first started as a journalist, one of the, the skill sets you would learn um, was court reporting. Um, there are dozens and dozens of courts that no longer have reporters. Um, councils, until very recently, um, most councils didn't have a reporter in council meetings. They, we now only have reporters in council meetings because the BBC funds a scheme, um, the Local Democracy Reporters Scheme. So the public interest journalism is, is vital to our democracy. It's vital to the functioning of, of our country. Um, and unless we can find a way to get more funds into um, some of the aspects of this, unless we can find an environment that is going to allow this journalism to flourish, then we are going to be in quite a, a bleak, dark place. Thank you. Um, let's go to uh, Jonathan next. Jonathan, you're... you're say too much because I think Adam and Rachel have, have, have covered the terrain really really well I mean I just add a personal reflection I was I was I was talking yesterday to an audience maybe slightly younger than today's audience um they were first year undergraduates at a London University studying communications I began by asking them what news they regularly read or consumed and most of them didn't really have an answer some said yeah yeah we look at the BBC some looked at the Guardian I'm glad to say Matt um, but most said, don't really look at news. And I said, well, how do you know what's going on in the world? And they said, well, we, we, yeah, we sort of know, we know, we pick it up. Well, how do you pick it up? Well, we pick it up from social media. Well, when you say you pick it up from social media, do you mean that, you, you know, your friends are telling you stuff on social media and you think that's news? No, 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 we click links and we read websites. That, okay, you're reading news, but you don't know that you're reading news. And when you've actually asked them what they think about journalism, they said, no, no, we don't really like journalism. It's quite bigoted and the journalists have got an agenda and we don't really trust them. So you're in this weird situation with this generation and it's, it's in stark terms for that younger generation, but it's not that different from, if you look at the you know, research into older demographics as well, a lot of people don't actually actively go out and seek public interest journalism. They read it by mistake and they don't necessarily know that it's journalism that they're reading. And as a result, they've got no idea of the work and effort and skill and training and qualifications that go into producing that content. They just think it sort of appears by osmosis. So they don't value it. So there's a big cultural problem there around that valuing. It means that in the UK, we've got the lowest trust in journalism, but also the audiences that are least willing to pay for journalism of any countries that the Reuters Institute has, has studied. And the ultimate problem then is obviously you've got an industry that is teetering, as Rachel says, particularly in relation to local news, particularly in relation to investigative, there are areas where the market at the moment, we can talk more about solutions and you know particular aspects of this, but at the moment I'd say there's a profound market failure, which is both economic but also cultural. Okay, thank you very much. Um, our final um, comment on, on first question around the state of the health and the uh, importance of public interest journalism, uh, Matt Rogerson from The Guardian. Thanks, Andy. Um, look, I think it's a bit of a case of feast and famine, really, in, in, in the sense that um, the quality of journalism that's put out into the market um, is often as good as it's ever been. Um, and there's still sort of huge investment going into investigations and covering key issues. And actually, if you look at kind of public trust in the media um, over a long period, it, it's, it's holding up, you know, it's still strong. You have, have done some data recently. There's slight divergence between political parties about which part of the media and the public trusts. Um, but there is kind of widespread trust of what, what the media does and the role of the media. Um, and clearly, I think it's, you know, we're in a once in a generation moment at the moment um, with COVID happening, Brexit happening, lo you know, lots of change in, in our society in particular. Um, and I think the role of the press on all sides, you know, left and right, is important to sort of expose hypocrisy and, and kind of cronyism in power. And also to ask questions about the laws that are sort of restricting our freedom and, and liberty at the moment, for, for good reasons, but I think it's important that the press is there. And I think 
the public probably value that and, and will value that through this period. Um, I think the tri tricky thing is how do we quantify the value of public interest journalism? And it's really tough because we kind of get a sense of um, uh, the value that it plays and, and knowing what's going on in our kind of local communities, but also in kind of the national polity. Um, but one of, the, one of the ways that, you know, an exa one example that I've found where there is a metric is if you look at um, uh, the Panama and Paradise papers that we, we were part of a consortium in reporting the implications of, of, of the leak of those documents in relation to tax avoidance and tax evasion. Uh, a recent parliamentary question confirmed that HMRC in response to those, those revelations and those documents that came out to light, they're recovering about 200 million pounds in revenue as a result of those stories. And that's a really concrete example, I think, of where there's cause and effect in the journalism that's been published on a particular issue. Um, and I think if we had more of that, that, more of that kind of independent research on the value of, of high quality journalism, the value of kind of public interest journalism in um, the role that it plays in kind of creating efficient and fair democracies, that I think um, it would drive kind of more of a willingness to pay perhaps, but also would may be able to justify other interventions in the market to ensure that the news media uh, survived and thrive. Um, and that's something we, I, I was part of the Ken Cross review, I was kind of sat on a little panel that helped to advise the chair of that. Um, that was something that we kind of talked about in terms of, you know, how do you produce independent evidence around the value of news media? I think, you know, Dame, Dame Francis saw that as being kind of an institute that could oversee that, and that, that's kind of one way of doing it. I think the Lords have ideas about, the Lords report today that's come out, uh, has ideas about, um, you know, some kind of body to oversee, uh, you know, independent, uh, independent evidence gathering and a sense of where, where there are gaps in provision across the country. I think those are kind of really important um, potential roles for, for government in coordinating that so that we can really understand that value in a detailed way and, and, and where those gaps are. Thank you. Um, I, I, I want to sort of take this thing that is public interest journalism. Um, by its very nature, it's, it's something people will pay for out of, of self-interest. Given this and its importance, um, how do you actually think it should be funded then? We've touched on some of these already, but uh, you know, what, what is the model that you would see coming forward, Rachel? Um, well, I don't think there is a silver bullet here. I don't think there's one answer. Um, what we need to do as a, as a sector and as a country is encourage an environment that allows a diverse um, stream of funding. Um, relying on one funding stream has proved problematic. You know, the, the, the big drop in funding is for the news media is, is in advertising. Um, we're obviously seeing a drop um, in terms of, of buying papers too, although the paywall has provided part of an answer to that and the, the membership model and subscription model have provided a part of an answer to that. Um, so as I say, I don't think there's a silver bullet. I don't think there's one answer. Um, the area that I would like to talk about is um, access to um, philanthropic funding. Um, I think what we need to do is encourage a wide and diverse flow of funds. Um, you only need to go across to the US to see what um, a difference um, access to philanthropic funding can make. Um, there's quite a lot of research done over there about um, the not-for-profit news sector um, that exists there. The most recent figures I have seen were in an article a couple of weeks ago um, in the New York Review of Books. Um, and this article uh, quoted a figure of 300 million US dollars that flows into the sector every year. So that's 300 million US philanthropic do dollars that flows into public interest news. Um, it keeps alive 3,000 jobs. Um, it supports over 200 organizations. So, you know, this is a, a, a substantial sector in the US. Um, you come to the UK um, and it's non existent. We have a small handful of, of organizations that have more than one or two people, like the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. We have the 500 organizations that Jonathan mentioned, but most of those are one or two person um, voluntary organizations. They are not thriving businesses or thriving, thriving um, um, organizations. Um, and one of the big issues that we have in this country is that journalism doesn't have access to philanthropic funds. Um, there is a lot of philanthropy in this country. There is a lot of public will to support community-based assets, and we see it all the time, um, but none of this is getting into journalism. So 
um, I think we should really embrace um, access to, to charitable funds and to help provide this as a stream of funding that can come into the sector. Um, it is a subject that has been talked about quite a lot. Um, the Bureau has been going for 10 years. We set up with the intention of becoming a charity. We applied to be a charity and we were, we were rejected. We applied a second time and we were rejected. Um, we now have a trust that is set up as a charity and this can fund aspects of our work that our trustees agree um, are charitable, uh, serve a charitable purpose. Um, but it's hard, it's cost us a lot of money to get there, it's cost us a lot of resource and, and time and, and effort and it is not, um, you know, in the, the way that we've got it set up at the moment, um, it opens a small amount of charitable funding. Um, we think there will be a lot more if, if we were able to, to open up um, even further. Um, th this is laid out, there's a whole section in the House of Lords report um, at the back of the, the report today, which covers the arguments and, and um, the discussion that's going on in this area. I think it is worth saying, a couple more points I'd like to make, it is worth saying that we don't need a change in law for this to happen. Um, there's lots of legal argument out there to say that you know this is not this doesn't require an act of parliament this is it, the, the law will allow this to happen we just need the political will um to to help push this this through so um it's been discussed in, in by the commission it's been discussed by um the, the Cairn Cross review um as i say we just need to open ourselves up to it a, a little bit more and i i think it's the the last point i would like to make is that it shouldn't be seen as um, a sort of irrelevance or um, something that will support um, a, a tiny sector or, or a tiny few. Yes, it's not a big sector at the moment, but it can become a much more um, functioning, thriving sector if we were allowed access or provided access to these funds. And it's not gonna be an answer to everyone. This is not an answer to um, businesses that are looking to make a, a, a profit or pay dividends, um, but it is, a piece of the puzzle to a form and a way of supporting public interest views. Thank you. Um, Matt, I wonder if I, I can sort of come to you next. Um, I, I'm really interested to hear how you think it should be fun, but uh, what if you, you might want to pick up a little bit on what Rachel said there around the US model and, and philanthropic uh, support. Do you think we're not seeing that in this country? Um, partly because in, in the US we have um, so uh, such a very different uh, broadcast media environment uh, that, that um, there is a need for that philanthropic uh, support there in, in, uh, in the way that it is. Yeah, I think, I think potentially, Andy. I mean, I think, um, you know, we, we, we have a Guardian.org, uh, part of the organisation that operates in the US, and that, that works with um, philanthropic foundations to get money to, to fund journalism uh, directly. Uh, and it's kind of independent of those philanthropic organisations, but accords to a kind of set of set of aims and objectives um, that are shared between kind of that organisation and uh, and Guardian.org. Um, I mean, we all, we also work with um, uh, the Bureau in the UK. We we had an article, a partnership with them this week, I think, on um, an investigation into soya plantations in in Brazil. So I think there is a there is a kind of growing role for um, charitable organisations and charitable journalism. Um, in the UK environment. Um, I, I think ultimately it's, it's going to be part of a mixed ecology and a kind of mixed mixture of revenue streams that are going to fund public interest journalism going forward. Um, I think advertising has played a big part in the past and continues to play a part in, in uh, print and, and online. Um, clearly it's taken a big hit as a result of COVID as, as um, most parts of the advertising market have. Um, there are also kind of imbalances of power in the advertising market, which we hope that the CMA will address through their new digital markets unit. And I think there what we're asking for is not um, anything out of the ordinary, really. It's a level playing field, uh, a level playing field on sort of um, removing barriers, uh, but also making sure that kind of the biggest recipients of advertising play by the same rules as uh, independent publishers and other businesses that operate online, I think that will be a big step forward in sort of equalizing power in the, the online advertising market. Um, but I think there's also, uh, and, and you know, newspapers themselves, you know, the, the cost of a newspaper still contributes significant amounts of money to um, fund public interest journalism. 
Um, uh, our business has transitioned very much to digital, so the majority of our revenues are now digital, but I know with the kind of nationals and locals that they will rely significantly on newspapers. Um, but I think I'm, I'm sort of relatively optimistic that um, there is an appetite for, the, for consumers to actually pay for public interest journalism. Um, and you're right, I think the US market is different, but if you look there, the New York Times clearly produces public interest journalism and looking at their results, their last results, they were running profit of almost $40 million on revenues of $426 million. So for them, certainly their business, they've worked out a way to um, ask their readers to, to pay to fund the journalism that they produce. Um, and I think from our perspective, you know, our business is going in the right direction. We're, as I said, we've, we're, we're now 50, 56% digital revenues um, uh, our readers now account for 58 percent of total revenues that we generate so it, you know we're not as reliant on advertising as as, um, as maybe some other publishers are um, and the appetite for, for public interest journalism journalism is just huge um, you know we we put out some numbers recently to show that we had our biggest day ever on the across our site and, and digital services on 4th of November after the US election um, we had 190 million page views and 52.9 million unique browsers in just 24 hours. And that kind of exceeded all, all traffic we've ever experienced across our services. So there is a real appetite. Uh, I think the question is how do you convert people from being readers to being um, uh, in a recurring relationship with us? And I think that's going to be the real, um, the real job of work over the next period of time for, for publishers in terms of trying to create not just a sustainable business model but heading towards kind of a more profitable business model where we can invest that money back into more journalism and kind of get that self-fulfilling cycle going mm, yeah um jonathan i'm going to come to you finally and, and i suppose in some respects as the um the ceo of public interest news foundation this is the fundamental question for you uh you know how should public interest journalism be funded um do you want adam on this question as well or or, or um... Yes, I'm going to come back to Adam in a second. Yep. Oh, okay, good. Let's just make sure he's not left out. Um, um, so, I mean, just, just just to briefly pick up on the charitable issue, it's, it, it, it's definitely part of the solution. I agree with Rachel. I think one thing I'd add to that, so at, at PINF, we have now got charitable status. And as far as we, we, we were aware, we're the first charity in the UK that's got this explicit remit to promote public interest news, which is fantastic. And it was nice to see that acknowledged in the House of Lords report this morning. But what that does, I think, is two things. It does, it does mean that we could act as a funder and we could simply support news organisations that meet our criteria for public interest news and which cannot find any other source of funding. So where there is an absolute gap and there's, and there's clearly no viable market uh, route towards uh, sustainability then th there we are and i noticed this actually i think chris matheson was asking a very sensible question in the chat about what do you do in charitable journalism to, to deal with the maybe potential interest conflict of interest you've got a philanthropist or a corporate or someone who's pushing a certain agenda well one answer to that question is to work with a body like pin which can put a kind of firewall in place you know i think ideally philanthropists and corporates and others or even government might think okay we could give money to an organization like him we can then give it off in turn so you have an arm's length relationship there but also just i think it's important to stress we don't see that only as a sort of sticking plaster where there is a definitive market failure we can invest in organizations to enable them to experiment and innovate with other revenue streams. So I think Matt's right. There, there is an audience out there that is able and willing to pay for news if it can be sold to them in the right way and, and made, made easy for them to, to sign up. And there's all sorts of interesting work going on now with micro payments and people who might sign up to have a kind of online wallet where they spend five or 10 pounds a month on a variety of news organizations as they travel around the internet and pennies go out of their wallet as they land on particular sites. So there's lots of innovations like that that we could be supporting and there's advertising i do think there's you know publishers can still make money through advertising we've seen interesting models in the independent sector where some small and very ethical sites are able to actually sell that advertising at a premium to businesses that want to be associated with something that has got that sort of community trust and 
a real sort of commitment to the local area. So PINF can, can support journalism where there's clearly no viable model, but we can also support journalists to give them a bit of a chance to explore models that maybe haven't quite taken shape, but there's definitely potential there. Okay, thank you. Adam, I want to come to you finally on, on, on this point. Um, and I'd be really interested from, from your perspective of, of running perhaps a slightly different operation to, to other panellists. Um, what's your take on how public interest journalism should be, be funded? Yeah, um, thanks. Um, yeah, I think public interest journalism, again, I, to repeat myself from, from the, the last question, I, I think it's a, it's a specific type of journalism. So um, again, it's got specific constraints. I mean, some of the other panelists have, have touched on this. I mean, Jonathan's comments were, were very interesting about how um, I think ultimately there needs to be some sort of shift in, in mindset that people need to understand that. I mean, I think the shift to digital particularly um, has made journalism seem a bit more intangible uh, and people just just don't understand that, that there's a whole infrastructure there that is required to to actually produce this stuff and it takes people's time and time is money and somehow it's got to be paid for so ultimately i think more people are going to have to be willing to to fork out and pay for journalism and it's nice to hear that that you know the guardian's doing quite well with that and new york times that i'm also a subscriber to <laughs> are doing quite well with that um i think philanthropy i think that's that's an interesting option but the key thing is if, if you want public interest journalism to continue to be in the public interest, you've got to be careful about how the sources of funding influence the content. So I'd be a little bit careful. I mean, I like uh, Jonathan's, talk, Jonathan's comments about um, trying to keep the philanthropists sort of one, at, one, at one step removed because you know, I would worry that that uh, if you leave it up to rich individuals and rich organisations to to fund journalism, that's going to skew things. Um, advertising, advertising is great, but there's also you know there's a danger there that um, if you rely too much on ad funding, apart from the fact that it's quite volatile and in a crisis like this, it's one of the first things that goes away. I can say that from the perspective of news now that uh, that the, the, when COVID hit, you know, our ad revenues tanked. Um, but also, you know, if you're primarily ad funded, there is certain, it becomes difficult to say certain things because you want to, you have to continue to keep your advertiser happy. Um, so I think other sources of funding are are of interest. I mean, the, the other thing is that that public interest news need, needs to needs to be accessible to to as many people as possible, and subscriptions are, are a great idea, but um, in order to operate subscriptions, you have to be operating a closed system, right? You have to lock down your content and people have to subscribe to sign up. And ideally, you want uh, as many people as possible, including people that can't afford a subscription, to be able to access that. So donations are interesting. But again, from the perspective of news now, to answer specifically from the perspective of news now, we want people to have this varied news diet. And we're a news aggregator, so we link to thousands of publications. So if I want to argue for people to subscribe, for the type of people that are using news now, and you know, we would argue that lots of people should be doing this, read widely to get a broad perspective. It doesn't really, it's not really feasible to subscribe to dozens of publications. So you need some sort of concentration system like services that allow you to make a sing single sign up and access lots of these things. There's a few startups that are doing this already, but I think it's also an idea to, to try and do that with, uh, with donations. So, the sort of donation and support system that the Guardian has got, you could have a platform where people have a single sign on and they can direct their money to a basket of different publications. And this is something that we've been in discussion with at Newsnow to see, you know, if this is something that we can that we can try and facilitate. But I just, you know, emphasize that that the sources of funding inf influence the content. I do think that um that government's got a good a role to play here. People mentioned um, charitable status. That's come up a lot. You know, Karen Cross recommended that. Uh, I think that's a great idea. Um, presumably, uh, if a journalistic organization, organization becomes a charity, then uh, your donations to that are, are also gift aid eligible. So yeah, that's great. And I mean, and that's for a particular sector of the market because, I, you know, I don't, mainstream media organizations are not going to get charitable status because they're 
profit generating enterprises but there's a potential to 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 really sort of give a push to an independent sector we can have a, a fantastic uh diverse landscape for public interest media okay that's um interesting i, I want to pick up on your comments there around sources of, of uh, revenue influencing the, the the content and and talk about state funding of, of uh, news media um uh, i mean uh, you know in this country we spend huge amount of time talking about state funded media um yet um you know we we seem to all have very very different views on it it's it's hard i think not to argue that the state could in theory provide significantly more support and I, I'm, I'm really interested to know sort of the opportunities and pitfalls of of looking at the way that the, the state funds the media or, or state support or public interest journalism and how that might work um and and given we we all have views on the bbc i don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time talking about the bbc in this but you know in terms of a broader public interest journalism um jonathan what, what, maybe you want to pick up on this one first yeah i'll have a go andy thank you i mean i think i completely agree with you it's to me the question, does the state have a role? The answer must be yes. There's a, there's, a pro, there's a problem for our democracy. This is not just a sort of economic or technological problem. This is not an industry where we could all say, oh, well, that was a 20th century industry. Let's just wash our hands of it and say goodbye. There is something, I think the House of Lords said this very well in their reports, you know, there, there is no question of the fundamental role of high quality journalism in, in a democracy. It provides that vital tier of, of where you get shared information and shared facts. So the question isn't whether the government should, should play a role, it's, it's what is the role? And I think, you know, that there, there, there is a lot of talk about direct subsidy. And I think in the Ken Cross review, there was a, a, a vision of an organization analogous to the Arts Council, ideally, you know, independent of of government operationally independent at least receiving long-term financial settlements and with total discretion about how it awards that funding to organizations i'm open to that model i think actually though and i know that that model does frighten the horses and i know that government did not go for that model and, and came back with various arguments about why they thought it wasn't their job to define and support public interest journalism and to pick winners there is something in the government's position. I think it was short-sighted, and I think it missed a lot of the nuance to the proposal. But even, let's say that we think there's a massive problem, but we're not quite ready to go down the kind of Arts Council type route. Why don't we spend the next three years doing everything that we can to give publishers the best possible chance to find their own solutions? There's, there's I would say there's sort of three aspects to that. There's, you deal with some of the regulatory issues we can talk about in a moment, but there are big regulatory issues around unfair competition between publishers and platforms. There's also a secondary risk there of unfair competition between publishers where you've got some large dominant publishers who are this sort of incumbent status in the market and smaller startups that are struggling to um, get themselves off the ground. So I think the bargaining code that uh, the digital markets unit will be responsible for overseeing could give all publishers a chance to actually get a fair share of revenue and data for platforms. So that's one big thing government can do that could, could have an impact. I think, like I said before, government can also invest in publishers to enable them to transition to digital. That was the other thing that Ken Cross recommended. So you're not funding content, which I think has got some issues of political conflicts of interest and interference but you're publishing um, you're, 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 you're supporting um, experimentation with new forms of advertising new forms of reader revenue new forms of philanthropic support and then you know you, you and then the third thing that government must be doing in real time is monitoring as Matt says you know we we still have big big knowledge it's amazing I feel like we've been talking about this for several years some of us there are still big knowledge gaps we know there are news deserts in the country where there isn't a good local newspaper we need to really monitor that situation and i think let's say if after three years of a combination of regulatory interventions investment in innovation and really good forensic real-time research if after that we can see that there is still something not working then let's move to the arts council type model and deal with some of the governance issues that do arise there i think you can deal with them but I'm not sure that we actually actually need to do that today. I think there are other things government can do in the meantime. 
Okay, thank you. Matt, can I come to you on, on this point? What are, you, yeah. what are you doing on, uh, on state funding and, and support for, for this type of genders? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll say one thing about the BBC and then I'll move on to kind of the other, which is I think the BBC is a good example of where if you do get public funding, the kind of level of push and pull and pressure from people who are responsible for giving that funding takes up most of your life basically and i think i think the they're so bogged down in that kind of relationship with 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 kind of the state and that intervention that um i personally wouldn't want to want to have that um that pressure on me all the time because i just think it, it it's just it's just really tough um uh i think obviously the license fee does fund some news media functions so as already been mentioned the local democracy report scheme is effectively top slicing of the license fee and you have their local democracy reporters working inside listed businesses so there is a, a kind of transfer of quasi public cash to news media at the moment um and then i think the other bit which is not probably known is that public notices also play a big part in in sustaining local journalism uh through uh, you know in local newspapers and that's currently under threat so i know if my colleagues in the NMA from the local newspaper sector were here, they'd be saying that that, sh that kind of local notices, those local notices should be, those public notices should be maintained. Um, but I think from, from my perspective, the, the, the big role for the state is to, to help to fix the market in which we operate. Um, and uh, I think removing the bar barriers that, that stand in our way from, from moving towards uh, sustainability and you know, potentially profitability are key. Um, the, the, the digital VAT change that came in uh, in May to, to reduce that to, to equalize that with newspapers to zero percent that was a that was a big step forward uh, and I think the government did the right thing there it enables um, experimentation in terms of subscriptions and micropayments and also um, uh, you know other forms of payments so I think that was a really welcome step forward um, we've already mentioned and apologies for, for, for laboring it I think the CMA point is really important in terms of um, a level playing in the digital advertising market but also, I think that unit will look beyond advertising to, you know, is it fair that these kind of gateways, these app stores charge 30 percent of a new subscription? Um, uh, I think the, you know, when they're, they're processing those payments at marginal cost, 30 um, percent seems quite high, high fee to be taking. And hopefully when the digital markets unit gets up and running, it will start to look at issues like that, as well as kind of conflicts of interest that are built into the fact that these businesses now span effectively the whole of the digital economy from handset through to. Uh, app store um, uh, I think uh, uh, in terms of what, what else the government could do um, we have previously as an industry advocated the idea of an R&D tax credit um, and if you think about what I said at the start about actually journalism itself is in is in pretty rude health um, I think an R&D tax credit could help to, to um, news organizations kind of build the underpinning infrastructure that would help us to serve our readers better to develop kind of payment models and uh, infrastructure that um, would enable uh, people to, to kind of contribute and pay in different ways. Um, and if you look at what's happening in the US, uh, the Washington Post has a, an R&D tax credit from Jeff Bezos, uh, and they're building uh, lots of lots of new infrastructure to underpin their business, both on the kind of advertising side and also how their, uh, their, their journalism is processed through their systems. And, and you can see they're rolling that out to lots of different publishers in the US. So that's having a, the ability to spend uh, money generated by, uh, in their case, their owner, but, but uh, you know, potentially through an R&D tax credit could have a real impact on the business model of news. Um, and I suppose the last thing is just in terms of the role of the state in making sure that journalists can go about doing their job um, and that, that public institutions are open to scrutiny. And part of that is the court reform that's going on at the moment, making sure that journalists get access to courts in a meaningful way and, and take best advantage of um, digital technology making sure that council meetings are open around the country uh, as much as possible so that journalists can do their job and then also i think the foi regime um every few years i have to write a consultation saying why the foi regime is important and why they shouldn't start charging large amounts of money to to, to access it um and only this week or last week there was a kind of there was a, a story about um the foi regime and a, a kind of part of the cabinet office that looks at tricky ones to make sure that they're not that nothing too controversial comes out. I think FOIs and, and the questions that you put down, Andy, in Parliament, you know, parliamentary questions, having straight responses to those questions is absolutely vital for, for public, scru public scrutiny and for, for journalists to be able to do their job. 
Um, I'm conscious of time and I want to fit in one more question. So Rachel and Adam, when I come to you, if I could just ask you to be fairly brief on this. Uh, Rachel, would you still feel comfortable if the um, Bureau of Investigative Journalism was funded by the state? Um, well, constitutionally, we're not actually allowed to take state funding, so um, I wouldn't be able to do that. Um, it, it's quite tricky if you're doing public interest news and you, you've got to question the government if you're, um, you know, you're, you're requiring funding from, from the government. So it is a tricky, it, it is a really knotty, tricky, thorny issue. Um, I think the one point that I'd like to make is to back um, Matt's point about um, it, sh it should really be focused on um, encouraging um, an environment that allows innovation. You know, this, the, the answer to this is going to be innovation, isn't it? We, we can't keep propping up models that are that are, are starting to fail and are no longer working. We've got to find new ways of, of funding public interest journalism. So we've got to find, um, if, we, if we want to put state funding in or we want to provide an environment that the state creates that encourages this, it's got to be around encouraging innovation. And that means taking risk. It also means encouraging new players, not just the old beasts that have been here. Um, and it's that, it's, it's, you know, that risk taking or that environment that allows others to thrive. So um, uh, regulation that allows other people to come into the sector is, is what I would encourage. Thank you. And uh, Adam, if I can come to you then, um, uh, you know, are you playing a role in that risk taking and allowing those new entrants to, to come in and, um, and, 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 and get their news out to, uh, to other people? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, as a news aggregation platform, um, we uh we've got thousands of publications that, that we link to and um we've got a set of of objective criteria that we apply to people that want to be on news now so you have to be you have to be well established you have to be uh writing content that is original and well definitely the case that we've got a lot of small publishers on, on the system and um yeah it's a great way for people to to get started um, if they're writing good stuff, they can be on news now and they can, they can get traffic and that's, that's a great way to, to get started. I think in terms of government funding in general, obviously like you don't want government to have too much influence over, over content. So that's tricky. Um, as regards to the BBC, I think BBC is great. There's, there's a lot of uh, good things that BBC is doing. The, this local news initiative is, is great, but I think the idea of government funding going to one monolithic organization that is that is in the market and in competition with other people is not not ideal i think funding should be going to to a more diverse range of, of publications other people have, have said on the panel and there needs to be a lot of smaller organizations so this is what good government can do the other things that people have said are great char charitable status and so forth that's all good um Matt's idea about about tax credits that's that's also fantastic I think there's maybe a couple of other things um match funding government can offer to, to match funds um donations to to journalistic organizations that's a way of keeping government a bit at arm's length from from deciding where where, where the funds are going to go because it's up to the public to to decide what they donate to and government just match funds that is something that, that is uh, like well understood and and uh, has been done before and then just briefly the, the other little thing is we had an idea for a news credit scheme the the NUJ uh, proposed something similar and um, the French for instance the French government has got a scheme where school leavers get given a certain amount of money to spend on newspaper subscriptions this is obviously a bit more difficult for government to, to implement but we thought this is another way potentially to for government to allocate funding but to take its hands away from deciding who, who actually gets it so you allocate a certain amount of money to all citizens and they can spend it on qualifying news publications so you need some independent body that decides who qualifies but that's a way to to sort of provide direct funding but keep it at arm's length but yeah charitable status and match funding and things like that i think there's, there's some things that government can do in the short term to have an impact and that's that's the big thing about government that it can uh, it can move fast and marshal funds in a way that will go faster than the market and that's what we need Thank you very much. Final question, uh, and I want to talk about fake news and how it can circulate like wildfire on, on social media platforms and, and change hearts and, and minds too. With, uh, without regulation, is, is, is social media really capable of 
disseminating information responsibly or is it inherent in uh, its DNA that on its platforms public interest journalism will be increasingly marginalised and, and undermined and, and if so what kind of regulation is, is actually needed there and I'm conscious of time and really want you to keep your answers fairly short on this one if I can come to you first Matt. Yeah of course um, so I think uh, we've seen I don't know whether you've read the New York Times story this week about Facebook changing the uh, the make of the composition of news on its platform after it realized that Biden was going to win. Um, but it shows that actually, I think, uh, political pressure or the threat of political pressure can actually change the behavior of the social media platforms. So I think that's the first thing to bear in mind. And um, second thing is when you say uh, inherent in its DNA, I mean, I think we should be more explicit. It's inherent in their business model. Um, and the advertising market that currently underpins social media platforms is based on advertisers putting money blind to the content they're funding. And those platforms not adhering with basic principles of GDPR, like consumers being able to decide whether a platform does or doesn't use their personal data for targeted advertising. Now, if you fix those two things in terms of enabling advertisers to see where their money's going, what it's funding, and if you equalize data protection uh, obligations so that those big platforms have to comply with the same laws as everyone else, then I think that DNA starts to um, uh, look a little bit different. And actually the, the platforms, the incentives are to begin to be aligned with, with media as it's um, uh, 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 practiced in the, in the past in terms of being responsible in terms of what they publish. Um, I think the final thing is just very quickly, uh, is just in terms of um, uh, policymakers' view on the, the, the value of news on, on key platforms. Um, and, you know, news was a key sticking point in the Sky takeover. You know, the, the continuance of funding of Sky News was a kind of big issue about who was going to take over that platform. So I think you see there that politicians have in the past intervened to make sure that a platform that occupies a lot of attention from UK consumers and UK citizens, that they do have obligations around the type of news and the quality of news on that platform. That is not a weird thing to do. And I think the online harms uh, legislation, that, that whole process provides the opportunity to, you know, politicians to reassert the, the value that we see in news and the role that those platforms have in making sure high quality news is widely available. Okay, thank you. Um, Adam, can I come to you? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I think what Matt said uh, about the business models of, of the current social media platforms that we have is true, that they, they operate this attention economy. And so um, they're not really, uh, they're incentivized to just get your attention and without any sort of pressure from outside, they're under no particular, uh, they're not under any sort of business pressure to promote truthful <laughs> content over lies. And I really think that um, from their own business perspective, like they, they, they will make some changes and they are making some changes to try to, uh, to address these issues with the spread of misinformation. But fundamentally the business model doesn't really drive them in that direction so I, I really think that um, ultimately it's going to take regulation to bring this thing under control um, I think the issue is with is with their algorithms and the way that they prioritize content this is one of the things that um, social media companies that, that every time that this these sorts of things come up they tend to argue that they're just they're a mere platform people post stuff and they're, they're just a, a kind of intermediary but actually via their algorithms, which they design and tweak for their, for their own ends, they're effectively operating, um, they're, they're operating like a normal media business. They're making editorial decisions via the design of these algorithms. So they need to start taking responsibility for that. And I, th I think regulation could, could be the answer. I mean, you know, with this digital markets unit, there's obviously appetite for regulating things in terms of their influence on the market. But I think ultimately it's gonna take regulation of how they're, algorithms actually operate so they should open them up to scrutiny we could have an independent regulator that, that would do that to try and force them to uh to comply um this sounds a bit extreme but i think when you we're starting to see some very very extreme effects of of social media algorithms on on the wider world on public health on the political situation you know in in the past um we could have all sorts of, of disagreements ideological disagreements but we agreed on the core facts, but now we really are in this kind of post-truth world where, where we can't even agree on the facts because so much misinformation is spreading via social media. So yeah, regulation for me is the answer.
Okay, Jonathan, is uh, regulation the answer for you too? I think one thing that's often forgotten is that platforms are already regulators. I think sometimes sometimes we sort of say their they're, they're platforms are publishers. Well, yes, to some extent, but, but they're not publishers in the way that The Guardian or The Times or The Daily Mail are, are publishers. They're not commissioning content. They are regulating content that other people are giving to them and they're making a huge number of decisions about what content is seen by what people at what time in what context they are regulators and they've got power both to, to, to give prominence to sometimes really low value dangerous harmful content or to suppress really high value public interest content that should be seen so i think what you need um, if it is ofcom that's to take on the oversight role that's been mooted under the online harms legislation Ofcom would really be looking at the kind of, as it were, regulatory decisions that platforms are already making and make sure that they're making them transparently and with the public interest at heart. I think that, so that, I'm totally signed up to that. Where I think there's a huge amount of detail still to be worked through is where it comes to the specific relationship between platforms and news publishers, where I think at the moment there's a bit of a sort of easy answer that you get from some publishers, which simply says, news content should not be subject to any oversight by Ofcom, that somehow there should be some magic wand waved and dodgy information that might come from an individual user or from your auntie is dealt with somehow, but news content is, is exempt so that publishers aren't ultimately regulated by Ofcom. Now I can see the logic for that, but you've got huge definitional problems. How are we going to measure that? You know, we all know certain well-known news brands, but as Rachel mentioned earlier, there's lots of new entrants coming in, less well-known brands. You know, there needs to be some transparent way of determining which publishers would benefit from, a, from, a, from an exemption if there is to be one. And if there isn't to be an exemption, how on earth are we going to, you know, avoid suddenly giving Ofcom regulatory powers over the news industry, which I don't think Ofcom particularly wants, and the industry certainly doesn't want. So yes, I think in principle, yes, but there's a big chunk of work still to be done. Okay, finally to, to you, Rachel, is um, social media at risk of, um, of causing irreparable damage to public interest journalism? I think the answer is clearly yes. I mean, I, we are, as, as has been already said, we are in, in a place where it's getting increasingly hard to distinguish between truth and, uh, and fact and, and misinformation. Um, and for society to continue functioning we have to find a way of of that working and then a way of actually distinguishing the difference between what is fact what is it, what is published and created by professional um news content creators and um, what is dis what is um created by people who want to spread disinformation either for profit or or, or even for harm um and I think regulation is an answer to this, um, as is transparency. I think the, the transparency point cannot be overemphasized, actually. Um, one of the big problems is nobody knows how this works. No one knows what the problem is or how certain um, things reach the top, how, what, what, what the algorithm works. It changes all the time. That's the other thing. We think we get a grasp on it, and then next minute it's changed again. So um, as much as regulation, I think, encouraging and forcing transparency around this is just as important. Rachel, thank you very much indeed. Now, I want to thank all of our panellists. Um, I'm very conscious of time. One of the things I've learned, uh, having arrived in Westminster, is that uh, uh, meetings in Westminster always start and finish on time. This one's ran over, uh, and I, uh, I apologise to any of my parliamentary colleagues that, that now need to be elsewhere. Um, what I'm going to ask our panellists to do is, if they have time, to respond to any of the comments that are in the in the chat function uh, by responding directly to, uh, to 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 those people that have made those comments. Uh, but I want to uh, draw this to an end by thanking our speakers, uh, thanking you if you've joined us uh, uh, for the first time, uh, or if you're a regular at the uh, APPG. Um, uh, it's been a really fascinating. Uh, discussion today and I think it sort of shows how broad this topic is we, we probably could have spent another couple of hours um, and really only just start to scratch the surface um, and and you know I think we've got a lot more 
uh, exploring to do. It's been very helpful from my perspective as a, uh, as a member of parliament to really hear some of the thoughts from, uh, from some really leading uh, practitioners today as well. So incredibly grateful. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, please do feel free to make any more comments uh, in, the, uh, in the chat if, if you would like to, uh, to, to engage with our participants there. I'm sure they'll be willing to, uh, to, to uh, respond and, uh, and come back to you as well. Um, thank you very much indeed to our, um, our, our uh, collaborator today, News Now, uh, who worked with us to uh, bring this. I, I said collaborator. I feel like I want to say sponsor. You know, I'm coming from a commercial radio world. I've, I've got to put an advert in there at the end. Um, but thank you very much to, uh, to News Now, uh, who've, uh, who've, who've been able to, to work with us to bring this today. Uh, and thank you also uh, to, uh, to the team uh, behind the APPG, the Secretariat, that do an incredible job to pull it all together and ensure that it's, uh, it's organised. Um, we, we're also really keen to invite anybody that's uh, joined us today uh, that wants to be part of the APPG blogging team uh, to write for us, uh, get involved with us and write for us. You can uh, get in touch with us uh, at, the, uh, at the APPG website or via the Twitter feed uh, or, uh, or through Facebook and, and engage with us as well because we really would like to hear your views. And uh, this is one of the APPGs that really is uh, engaged uh, with many, many parliamentarians uh, across, the, um, across the whole political spectrum. Uh, people do certainly come into this one and, uh, and engage with it. Uh, but if I can draw to a close by thanking our participants, thanking our attendees, uh, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.